I am very happy to be, at least virtually, back down in Missouri. Actually, sorry, I should repeat, back down in Kentucky. I was thinking of Missouri uh, a second ago, but in Kentucky, where I, last time I was there was in person, um, in Paducah, where I had the chance to attend uh, barn raising, which is definitely a Masonic highlight. I had the chance to meet Brother Rick Reeve while I was down there who is associated with the Masonic homes of Kentucky. And um, I really think that Masonic homes, which, you know, are located throughout the United States, different states, are a really, really cool aspect of the fraternity and a really great example of some of the wonderful things Freemasonry can do. So it's a pleasure to be once again visiting Kentucky and have the chance to speak to J. Scott Judy, Brother J. Scott, the CEO of Masonic Homes, and Brother Rick Reeve, who is the representative I met at the barn raising. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. It's always a pleasure. So let's start with, I mean, the basic question uh, for Brother J. Scott. What are the Masonic Homes of Kentucky? Uh, Masonic Homes of Kentucky are the oldest Masonic Homes in the world. Uh, Kentucky, I'm proud to say, and, and my Kentucky um, brothers back in 1867 actually founded the Masonic Homes, and they did so because, uh, in part because of the Civil War. Kentucky was a border state and had losses on both sides. Um, the Confederate and the Union sides. And because of that, um, there were many widows and many orphans that were left um, to fend for themselves. And our brothers took it upon themselves to, to uh, further their own obligations as Masons. And they started a Masonic Widows and Orphans Home. In 1867, we were actually chartered then uh, we were in downtown Louisville and we moved out to the east end of Louisville uh, in the 1920s where we had a 160 acre campus that was fully self-sufficient. We had our own uh, gardens, we had raised our own cows, pigs, chickens. We were completely self-sufficient and had our own school, uh, taught the orphans a trade so that when they they left the uh, the home that they could be gainfully employed. And at one time we had over 600 children living um, on our campus. It was a natural evolution because we had been we had taken care of of those uh, orphans and the widows primarily. That in in 19 uh, 1901 our Masonic homes of Shelbyville, which was 35 miles east of Louisville um, actually came into being. And it was um, the old Mason's home. That's what the, the name of it was. And that's what it served. There were old Masons that were destitute um, and they were taken care of at the Masonic home in Shelbyville. Those two organizations came together in 1993 you had the Old Mason's Home and the Masonic Widows and Orphans Home that came together uh, legally in 1983 to uh, form the Masonic Homes of Kentucky. At that time, prior to 1993, I should say rather, uh, we were for Masonic, Masonic affil uh, affiliates, wives, widows um, only. When we merged the two companies in 1993, we opened ourselves up to the general public and in doing so in order to allow Masons who had uh, benefits at that time, including Medicare, Medicaid, some of them started to have some private in, um, long term care insurance that uh, otherwise in the previous business model, they could not utilize those those um, benefits that they had uh, entitled to them. So in, in accepting those for our brother, Master Masons, or their wives and widows, um, that opened up the home for everyone to come and experience the, the um, joy and the active lifestyle that we offer here at the Masonic Homes of Kentucky. And 
And you know, what are what is the admissions process like if somebody uh, you know is looking at moving into the uh, Masonic Post of Kentucky, both in terms of individuals who maybe you know self sufficient but needing a new place to go, versus um, a mason or anybody who perhaps is having some health problems. Um, and it's the family looking at putting them somewhere where they can receive some assistance and help. That's a whole lot more complicated question than you probably uh, than you probably know. And um, let me just explain. Here on our local campus, we have uh, 400 independent living apartments. We have 48 assisted living uh, apartments. We have 167 skilled nursing beds and 50 personal care. Our Shelbyville campus also offers um, personal care, skilled nursing, and assisted living. However, at this time, they do not have independent living. So someone can move to the Louisville campus and continue through the whole continuum of care from independent living, which is um, like having an apartment building anywhere else. Uh, there are some additional benefits with the types of plans that we have where they can have a reduction in higher levels of care. But in, um, in our independent living, folks can, can move in to um, in income-based, where they have to qualify financially, a market rate apartment, which is just a, a rental, a monthly rental. We have something called life plan. People buy into that. It's a 50% refund of their uh, initial entry fee and they get 20% off of uh, higher at higher levels of care for off their room and board. Or we have something called life care, which uh, I'm proud to say Masonic Homes of Kentucky was the first life care community in the state of Kentucky. And three years after we opened that, we opened the second life care community. Life care is, is a unique um, business model because it affords people the opportunity to buy in, essentially get a 90% refund at the termination of the contract, which would be either voluntarily termination or, or involuntarily. But should they need to go to a higher level of care, they pay an equalized rate. Um, skilled nursing care today in our Sam Swope Care Center is about $10,000 a month. We average all those monthly service fees and they, they pay almost $5,000 a month. And it's, it's like insurance in that you have everybody paying in a monthly service fee that then helps reduce the single amount of uh, expenses for that individual. So the, those folks would just move in. Uh, they apply, They uh, depending on um, where they want to live, they would qualify financially. Um, if they don't have any assets, we can take care of them there. Um, and then assisted living uh, is a combination of uh, folks that are living with us in independent living, they come to live with us in, um, from the community. Personal care, uh, folks need a little bit higher level of care um, in their uh, activities of daily living. It may include memory care also. Skilled nursing care um, is, a, is a whole different uh, line of business. Skilled nursing care, uh, we do about 120 admissions a month. We are the single largest short-term rehab provider um, of, of skilled nursing care in Louisville and account for about 20% of all of the discharges from the hospitals there. So most of our skilled nursing uh, comes from the hospitals with short-term rehab. However, we do have um, many folks that are on long-term care with us also. You know, this is something I've discussed with other um, you know, Masonic organizations that provide services for our, our public. Um, you know, for example, the Masonic Medical Research Institute out of um, New York State, uh, the uh, 
Illinois uh, Masonic Outreach Programs out of, out of Illinois. Uh, and I'm curious for yourself also, you, you mentioned earlier in this interview that it was in 1993, if I recall correctly, that Ooh. your services became open to the general public and you yes. had non-Masons. Um, and obviously, I'm sure many of your staff are not Masons and do not have Masonic connections. Uh, to what extent are the, the public, are the staff, to what extent are they aware of the Masonic history of the Masonic Forces of Kentucky? Do they just view it as just a name? I mean, I always think of, you know, uh, being from Windsor, my I always think of Detroit, you know, the Detroit Masonic Temple is, as far as people in Windsor know, you know, they think of it as a concert venue. They don't recognize that it's actually you know, a, a Masonic temple first and then foremost. What is the Masonic history? Uh, how much are people aware of the Masonic history of the Masonic was in Kentucky? And um, has, has anybody ever, you know, there's plenty of unfortunate conspiracy theories floating around. Has that ever been a concern with any members of the public looking to, or staff, whatever, is looking to um, partake in their services or move into the Masonic homes? Um, I'll say generally, uh, the general public doesn't know much about our, our fraternity. Um, I'm coming up on my 25 years uh, of being a Mason. I'm a fourth generation Kentucky Mason. My, my father, my grandfather, my great grandfather were all Kentucky Masons. You know, um, a lot of people think that you have to be a Mason to come here. And you, you, you just, that's something that we have struggled with um, since 1993. Uh, but there's a couple of things that play into that. And if you think about it, I know uh, here in Louisville, most of your healthcare systems were started either by um, church organizations or by fraternal organizations. Baptist Hospital, obviously, um, it was associated with Baptist. Norton Hospital was associated um, with the, um, I want to say Episcopalian, but I don't, uh, the Methodist Church, excuse me. Um, and then you have, then you have Jewish Hospital downtown, which is, it, it has done uh, world renowned uh, heart surgeries, heart replacements, artificial hearts, hand replacements. Um, so I think about those different organizations and, I, you know, people obviously know if you're sick and you need care, you don't have to be one of those denominations to, to receive the services there. For some reason, we've struggled um, a lot with people thinking, knowing that they can come here. But in many cases, there's certain times throughout people's lives where you need a hospital. There's a very small period of time in your life, 65 plus, to where you might need independent living or a higher level of care. So it's something that people don't necessarily even know much about because they haven't had to experience it firsthand. So there's, there's a lot of that out there also. Um, I like to think that this is the first opportunity for many, many, many people to find out the values, the qualities that masonry has instilled upon not only me, but that, that Rick and I and our other members of our staff have helped to create a, um, an environment where Masonic values and the way that we care for people uh, resonates down with all of our staff. So I, I'm proud that, that we're able to, to be a first experience for many people for masonry. It's going to be a very positive experience for them. And uh, you mentioned our uh, brother, Reeve, who I had the pleasure of meeting in Paducah, Kentucky. Um, brother, if you could tell us your connection to the Masonic Homes of Kentucky, um, uh, yeah, just your connection, how it is that you, you are connected with them and um, kind of what you do for and with the Masonic Homes. Uh, yes, uh, you know, I'm the Senior Vice President of Fraternal and Development uh, Relations here at Masonic Homes. 
So it's kind of a unique opportunity or a unique role, you know, as, as a brother, you know, and, and then someone that came from the nonprofit sector to be able to oversee the charitable arm of Masonic Home. You know, uh, with that, you know, we have the Masonic Care a charitable connection for our Masons and our widows, as well as our non-fraternal members that need that subsidized care. And with those donations and that charitable work, my team gets to oversee those efforts. And then we also, you know, you know, it's kind of neat, you know, to, to learn the history myself, because I joined, uh, joined the team uh, back in July. So I've been learning a lot of the history and, and things like that and where it was originally the widows and orphans home. And then the last orphan graduating in the eighties and then the board of directors and, and the, the senior leadership felt that, you know, we need to look at our employees, you know, for, for, for a daycare cons- uh, and uh, assisted uh, program for young people. And to also bring back, you know, students onto the campus. So 10 years ago, as we just celebrated our our anniversary for Sproutlings, uh, pediatric uh, daycare and and preschool, we have, you know, room for 140 students. And with the administration down there, they share that roughly 40% of those students are medically fragile. And so it's neat. And we're the only school in the region that has that inclusion of traditional students as well as medically fragile students. And and it's neat to talk to those families where they say, you know, our son or our daughter that has grown up in this environment for the last 10 years uh, either they have some of the, the disabilities or they may not have the disabilities, but as they look at each other as students, they're all the same because those kids are learning together, playing together. Families are intermingling together. And with that, as we look at the subsidization for both Sproutlings and Masonic Care or that subsidized care, I get to work with the community to help raise those funds to offset those costs. And a component that they developed pre-COVID, our carefree living luncheon, and then we just had our second one here in Louisville uh, this September, it's based as a educational component to not only our fraternity members, but the general public. So on campus, we're very fortunate. The old dining hall, which is known as the Olmstead, uh, has been turned into one of those event center venues, uh, one of the premier ones in Louisville. And we have leased that service out to one of the the most outstanding venues uh, in Louisville that manages that venue. And, and we hold that luncheon there on campus. So we have hundreds of business people, fraternal and non-fraternal, that came in just in September and learned about what we do within Masonic Care. And, you know, it's, it's that luncheon concept of yeah, everybody knows they're coming in, they're going to be asked for a donation, but it's more about the education and building the rapport and with those individuals to learn what we're doing. And so that component is there. And we are going to hold our first annual one for the Shelbyville campus uh, in March of next year to do the same thing. You know, yes, We're over 110 years old in Shelbyville. We're 154 years old here in Louisville. But every day we're educating 
everybody on what we're doing. And this component, we're able to do that. And then with Sproutlings, you know, as a educational component to the community, we hold a golf tournament and then we have a, a Masonic masquerade that we held in, uh, in November. And, and those, you know, donations for those events offset the cost uh, there at Sproutlings. So it's unique to be able to do those things uh, for the same organization, but, you know, you have youth and then you have the adults. So I'm fortunate to get to, to secure donations at all levels of, of care, you know, for those individuals in the preschool daycare Sproutling Center, and then the ones uh, for adult care. Cameron, let me, uh, Rick made a good point, made me think of something. Um, 2017, we actually celebrated our 150th anniversary, which um, at the time we did a documentary and it's on YouTube. I would encourage your, your viewers and your listeners on YouTube to, to look up Little City Beautiful, which is what actually our campus used to be called by the orphans. Little City Beautiful, Masonic Homes of Kentucky. There's a nearly three hour documentary on there. Um, it's a little outdated because uh, some of the folks that on there have retired, like my predecessor and, and other folks, but it will give you an in-depth look at our history and really show you uh, uh, the personal touch and influences that we've had on the lives of, of some of the folks that have, have benefited from the, the Masonic Homes of Kentucky. It's a tearjerker. Yes, I will leave a link to that in the description. Uh, check that out for sure. Make sure to comment or, or subscribe, you know, leave a comment on the, the video um, to help it spread to other Masons uh, or the documentary. Uh, Brother Reeve brought up, and then I'm sure, you know, uh, Brother Dreedy would, would have some information on this as well. But in terms of donations and funding, how much of, of the donations and funding that is received, we don't need, you know, exact numbers, but roughly are coming from Masonic groups, Masonic lodges, Freemasons versus the, the general public? And also, um, do you find Masons... Like if a Mason out of state or even out of country, say in Ontario, wanted to support the Masonic Homes of Kentucky, um, how would he or his lodge go about doing that? Let me first say, and then I'll, I'll let Rick jump in here, but um, Kentucky Masons uh, are the individuals, not only with the inspiration um, and, and the vision to create an organization that would, would touch thousands and thousands of lives, over a 154 year history. They also figured out ways to have it paid for. Um, and shortly after we moved to this campus, we had a million dollar committee. And several, a couple of years after that, they actually burned the mortgage. And it was because of the generosity of those Kentucky Masons um, that we were able to do that. These days, um, the, uh, the donations that we receive um, come from, from Kentucky Masons. They also come from the general public, uh, people that we've served. And, and, and it's pretty equal uh, at, that, at, that, at this time, uh, these days here, more recently, it's, it's uh, pretty equal. Uh, but Kentucky Masons are, 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 have been very generous to us for a very, very long time and, and continue to do so. Um, in terms of um, outside of Kentucky, if, like I said, if a Masonic Lodge or Masonic individual or group or whatever it may be wanted to, you know, support um, the Masonic Homes of Kentucky or even congratulate them, you know, send us something as a congratulations on, at this point, over 150 years, um, you know, how would they he or they go about doing that? Uh, they can log on to our website, 
uh, Google Masonic Homes of Kentucky, and maybe there's a way for them to give online. Uh, they can call our office at 502-259-9627. Um, we can take uh, donations um, over the phone. We can give them the information where they could mail one if they wanted to, uh, to do that. Uh, if folks are, are willing to share their time, talent, and treasure, we find ways to make that happen. Um, let me also say to Cameron, um, and where I kind of thought you were going to go with that question, there is a, an association that Masonic Homes of Kentucky is a part of. Um, it's called Masonic Communities and Services Association. There are approximately 38 um, Masonic charitable organizations out there similar to Masonic Homes of Kentucky, whether they have uh, bricks and mortar or whether or not they have um, consultative um, and, and advisory services that they provide. I would encourage those that are interested, if they're, if they're not in Kentucky, go to the Masonic Communities and Services uh, Association website. You can find out where, where all of the Masonic homes are throughout the United States. Um, and you can find the services that may be available closer to you at home. And speaking of um, out of state, out of Kentucky, and I talked a little about this with, with Illinois Masonic Services. Um, we talked about you know them keeping in contact uh, regularly with other Masonic charities and other Masonic groups outside of Illinois. In terms of Masonic Homes of Kentucky, how, how often and, and how much communication do you have with other Masonic Homes? Um, do you regularly communicate with each other about um, well, just re really communicate with each other. I'm especially I'm wondering during the last two years with COVID, if you had regular discussions with them about practices and implementations and how to navigate kind of the, the very challenging times that have been the last two years. I'm assuming it was especially challenging for care homes and long-term care homes. Um, just what is the communication like between the Masonic Homes of Kentucky and some of those other 30, 38 homes throughout United States. You just, you just hit the nail on the head when, you, when you're talking with that question uh, about what the, the goal is of the Masonic Communities and Services Association. Typically, and historically, we'll have an annual conference in, in um, June of every year, and it's hosted, at a different, um, hosted by a different Masonic home. This coming June, we'll be in Mystic, Connecticut with our friends and brothers at Masonic Care in Connecticut. Um, we'll get together. It's a good opportunity for uh, senior management folks to get to know each other, uh, spend time together. And that's what MCSA, Masonic Community and Services Association, what we do at that time. Because we're, we want to help one another because of our Masonic mission and values and, 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 and regard for one another. But also we're not in competitive markets. Masonic Homes of Kentucky cannot go to Indiana. We cannot go to Tennessee. So we're restricted um, in our market area in Kentucky. We're not in competitive marketplaces together. So it gives us the opportunity to get together, share ideas. Um, we've been limited in, in because of COVID for the last two years, um, which I think has made us create um, different ways of getting together, similar to this Zoom format. We've had, had conferences, we've had uh, quarterly speakers on topics, uh, plus just the one-on-one -on -one of having a personal relationship. Um, I know Gary Charlin and Masonic Homes of California is a very dear friend. And I wouldn't have known Gary if it weren't for MCSA. Gary and I talk quite frequently. Um, every other week and we've talked more frequently uh, because of COVID but it's nice to have that that network of friends that you can trust that may be looking at some things differently uh, that we can implement best practices not only with COVID and, and the virus but just our regular average day-to-day -day operations. And then bringing it back within state um uh, like this might be a question for for Brother Reeve. Um, 
as you, you know, it, it always amazes me um, how often Masonic lodges or individual Masons, you know, they can be Mason for five, 10 years and not necessarily know all the different programs and services available within their jurisdiction, um, depending on how active they are. Um, you know, to what extent is the Masonic homes or, you know, to what extent are you traveling, visiting other lodges? And, you know, is the Masonic Homes of Kentucky kind of a well-known entity within Masonic lodges? Or is it constantly trying to advertise it? Or not advertise, but um, represent the Masonic Homes, like at barn raisings, at different events throughout the state? You know, that's the, 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 the second part of, of my position, you know, the, the fraternal side. You know, development is all about the relationships and, and that charitable arm. And then, you know, and then I have the privilege of overseeing the fraternal relations as well. And, and it's, it's, it's unique, but it's not unique only to Kentucky. But we have an ambassador corps. We have 30 uh, volunteer brothers across the state that have agreed to be an ambassador for the homes. And then we've developed regional ambassadors, you know, six regional ambassadors that work with those district ambassadors. And then we have a state ambassador that is kind of my, my volunteer, you know, to the craft. And uh, so they are out traveling, visiting lodges, visiting uh, barn raisings and, and different events, you know, sharing the word of what Masonic Homes Kentucky is doing. And, and for myself, it, you know, Jay Scott teases me once in a while when we're, when we're talking that, you know, Rick, you can be at lodge every night of the week and on Saturdays uh, visiting and, and telling the story of what is happening. And, and, and to be honest, the last six months that I've been in Kentucky, um, and that's where the Missouri concept came from because uh, still have a the family is still in Missouri, so I'm I'm there for the the New Year's party. So uh, you know, and that's the unique thing about technology that yeah, I'm I'm in Kansas City, Jay Scott's in Louisville, you're up north, and we're making this happen. But you know, with that, you know, every nonprofit, Masonic Homes of Kentucky, Masonic Homes of anywhere. USA, we are our best kept secret. Uh, you know, when you think every brother or widow knows what we believe they know, that meeting that I go and visit, I get the question. Was not aware that you all were doing that, or you do allow brothers to be up there or widows. Uh, and I and I love those questions when they ask because uh you know, they go, well, Rick, how many, how many Masonic affiliate residents do you all have? I said, well, right now we have over 225 Masonic residents living between Shelbyville and Louisville. And then they go, you know, and then the next question, well, how many of those brothers and, and widows are on the financial assistance part of it? I said, well, that's everybody. You know, we have brothers that are at Sam Swope. We have widows at Sam Swope. We have the same at our independent living uh, facilities, our assistant living. And they may not be on the charitable side to receive the services because they had no assets or they paid down their assets for the care that they were receiving and, and the facility that they were living in, but the ones that want to live at our campus, you know, they've sold their half a million dollar property. They're tired of mowing the yard. They're tired of doing those things. And they go, well, we're going to sell. Where do we go? Well, let's go to Masonic Homes. So they, you know, buy into one of those independent living um, apartments or, or, you know, rooms and I say they may never need a charitable connection, but they are making the connection 
by investing in the program because they're living on our campus and helping offset those costs by being there. So all 700 residents are part of the charitable program, either by living there or partially receiving some of the subsidized uh, services for the ones that are needing all of that financial support from a subsidized uh, component. Because even from the Medicare component that I've learned, as that was not part of my world before, that, you know, Medicaid and Medicare does not pay the full bill. You know, you may have someone that is on those services, and let's say because of the tier that they're a part of, maybe it's 50% reimbursement. Well, we at Masonic, we subsidize the other 50% of that. And then others, you know, may pay their own way forever, even if their need of care changes in five years, 10 years, they're going to be able to pay their way forever. But the part that is, you know, unique is if that changes, they have the ability of being here for those, those services. Yeah, Cameron, there's a couple of things, um, and, and Rick um, summarized it real well, but there's a couple of things that when you talk about the Masonic Homes of Kentucky, you can't have a conversation with, about the Masonic Homes of Kentucky without talking about the Grand Lodge of Kentucky and then also our Masonic Care Program. So let me touch on those two things really quick. The Grand Lodge officers, the six elected Grand Lodge officers uh, serve on our board of directors, which is comprised of 21 Kentucky Masons. So the other 15 um, are elected by the craft to serve on the Masonic Homes Board. Um, Without the, the guidance, the leadership, the support, the kind words uh, that, that we receive from the Grand Lodge, um, our organization would not be as strong as what it is today if it weren't for the support and leadership from our Grand Lodge officers. Uh, our Masonic Care Program is a pro is, is a part of our charitable arm, whereby any Kentucky Mason who's been in good standing for the previous five years, um, their wife or widow, they could be living in Ontario right now, as long as they're a Kentucky Mason who has continued to stay in good standing for the previous five years. They can move, make application and move into independent living, personal care, skilled nursing at either our Louisville campus or our Shelbyville campus. Uh, we average about 25 uh, folks who are uh, on our Masonic care program at any given time. And there has been no Kentucky Mason in the history of the homes that has ever applied for and qualified for, for the Masonic care program that's ever been denied care. Um, and, and, you know, that's that's something that that we take great pride in knowing that that if, should our Masonic brothers, their wives or widows need our services. That's what we knelt at that altar to do. And what we took our obligation for was to take care of our, our brothers, their widows and orphans. Masonic Homes of Kentucky is the, the is the embodiment of that obligation. What is the, um, uh, again, not exact numbers, but just relatively speaking, what is your normal uh, percentage percentages at the Masonic homes between um, residents who are Masons versus from the general public? And have you found since 1993 that the general public, I'm guessing, has increased steadily or as the word gets out? Um, just what's it been? What's that uh, balance like? Um, it has it, uh, the number of general public has increased steadily. Uh, 
particularly over the last 10 years, as we have opened up um, the, the two new independent living life care communities, Merrily and Meadow. Um, so yes, but uh, we did a poll a couple of years ago um, and we asked folks to share with us if they had a Masonic affiliation. So it may have been that the widow who's living with us, her, um, her uncle or her grandfather, her father may have been a Mason. And at that time, we had about 85% of the folks who were living with us. And we're close to almost a thousand people living uh, on one of our, our two campuses. We, uh, we have a third campus in um, Taylor Mill, Kentucky. Spring Hill Village, and it's a 48, um, 48 patio home community, all independent living. But um, we average about 85% of, of our population that has some type of Masonic affiliation. And I really like uh, uh, something you said um, earlier, and it kind of goes to my, well, it goes to, one of the, I think, the, the best parts about Freemasonry, but also kind of the, the, something a lot of Masons I don't think understand, I think it's exemplified very well by the Masonic Homes of Kentucky. You know, we talk a lot about, in Ontario uh, and other jurisdictions, where one of the phrases you hear a lot is, you know, Freemasonry contains great and invaluable privileges, um, is this idea. and. Uh, you know, a few times people have asked me what those are, uh, but there's always this implication. It's something by being a Mason, there's something that you will receive. You will receive uh, a privilege or a right or something special. But more and more, I think what, you know, I've come to realize, and I think unfortunately many others haven't, is that great and invaluable privilege is the chance to be part of something useful to be part of something that can make the world a better place. It's not you're joining it to get something, it's you're joining it because- To give something. <laughs> yeah. Give something. And by yeah. being a mason, you're able to give more because you're part of a group and you can combine your talents with that group and give more. And the Masonic Homes of Kentucky is just a great example of that. You know, by being a mason in Kentucky, you are part of an organization that is supporting something incredibly useful for- widows and aged masons and just aged individuals um and that also goes you know that's the danger when when i or other masons get upset or angry or annoyed with you know poor attendance at a lodge meeting or kind of masons hot dog in their shit part of that is because it impacts the ability of the lodge to do useful things like to create masonic homes and support masonic homes uh, and i really think that your answer you talked about you know, fulfilling the obligation, it just goes to show what Masons can do if they work hard within the craft. They can create something that exists for over 150 years and has, you know, I'm sure the numbers count at this point, but help countless orphans and children and up to, you know, widows and people without a place to go and people needing medical care. Um, you know, the, uh, the current Grand Master of Kentucky often talks about um, the importance of us in having fellowship in the lodge room. Um, but he also reminds us that as Masons, it's far more important for us to expose Masonry outside the lodge walls. And, and you know, that's exactly what the Masonic Homes of Kentucky does. Um, I'm a Shriner. I've been a Shriner for almost 25 years. I joined Shri uh, almost immediately after uh, becoming a Mason. And if you're a Shriner, and Rick can probably agree with me here, is you know people that have joined the Shrine because the child down the street, they were taken care of by a Shriner. The, the shrine has driven so many petitions. And of course, you have to be a Mason in order to be a shrine. Um, but people will join Masonry and join the shrine because of 
um, a beneficial, a positive impact that Shriner had on the child. I think that equally as important are the Masonic homes, whether it's Kentucky or in, in any other state. Um, and, and one of the best kept secrets of masonry are our Masonic homes. And our Masonic homes uh, have great value to all of the Grand Lodges because, as I said a minute ago, we're the embodiment of those values. And so many people see the care. You know, we're, we're not in the healthcare business. We're not in the independent living rental apartment business. We're in the trust business. People move in. And the reason that they come to trust us is because we're Masonic. There's a lot of trust associated with that word. They, we continue to earn their trust by taking care of their loved one whether it be their mother, their father, their child, their special needs child, whoever it may be. We're in the trust business, and it may be that we take care of them um, in, in many different settings. But that's what masonry is about. Masonry is based on trust, um, and, and the homes are a perfect example of why people need to be exposed to masonry and why they need to seek out more information on masonry. I would agree completely. I'd add to that, it's also the reason why masons need to make sure they're active in their lodges to make sure that there's a base of support for the Masonic homes going forward. I do wanna ask quickly, I did get some information which I shared um, on one of my, my weekly emails. Um, but I know that Kentucky uh, and Missouri, other places got hit a couple weeks ago with some pretty significant uh, tornadoes. Um, I'm sure you guys are, are okay, but in terms of, and I'll leave the link down there. Um, but if, first of all, you know, I hope you guys were okay and Masonic Homes didn't get hit, but also I understand that the Grand Lodge does have some support out there for any brothers who were affected by the tornadoes. But how are you guys doing? Were you guys okay? Nothing. Uh, it's, it's, well? it's funny you ask that question, and I know I see Rick, Rick smiling. Um, my son and I had the opportunity, and in fact, our uh, one of our Grand Lodge officers was supposed to have gone with us. Um, my son and I um, were in Tiptonville, Tennessee, um, duck hunting. And our very first night in the hotel, um, the tornado sirens went off. And um, the hotel we were staying in was destroyed by the tornado. Um, my son and I are lucky to be alive right now. There were three people across the parking lot who died. I know firsthand the generosity that the people in those affected areas, because I've been the beneficiary of that generosity. I know the generosity that, that Masons and non-Masons, you know, as Americans, that's what we do, is we take care of each other. And um, after everything we've been through in the last two years with COVID, and, and as difficult as that has been, the experience for my son and I to go through such a traumatic event um, really helped to restore a lot of my faith in, in mankind again, in humanity, uh, because of the, the generosity that, that we received. Um, from a, a Masonic standpoint, boy, our Grand Master in our Grand Lodge, um, the night of the tornado, I had many of them calling me, texting me, can I come get you? Do you need a ride? How are you going to get home? They took it a, even a step further, a, a big step further. And um, they have filled a warehouse at the uh, Grand Lodge office with medical supplies, uh, non-perishable items, clothing, shoes. Uh, and they are going to, they coordinated with Kentucky officials to make sure that we get those items 
um, to a holding area right now. But our grandmaster stepped up. He is a retired first responder. And, and um, I think that his, his professional obligations, his personal obligations, and his Masonic obligations really influenced the way that he reacted to such a traumatic event in the state of Kentucky. Um, I have not heard of uh, Kentucky Brother Master Mason um, who, who died because of the tornado. I hope that, that everybody um, was safe. And um, it, 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 was, it was disastrous. Uh, I know firsthand. I saw the, I saw the damage and was, was uh, involuntarily participated in it. But let me tell you, you know, it's, it's interesting. We talk about the Grand Lodge um, of the universe and in so many ways. And, and I'm, not, I'm not one to be preachy about my faith. I'm reserved about it. But the night that, that the tornado hit our hotel room, um, my, the, one of the first responders helped us get our, our luggage out because we went and stayed at the local high school. The next morning they were doing a recovery process and we were not, the civilians were not allowed back onto the site yet. And about noon we went back and one of the uh, firemen that had helped us get our luggage out of our room uh, was there. And he said, I went in and checked on all your hunting gear in your room this morning. It, everything was still there. Um, but he said, he looked over on the hood of his truck and he picked up a Bible. The, the cover, front cover and back cover, the spline were all off of it. He said, this was laying open on your bed this morning when he went in and checked our room. As much as I would like to say that my son and I had a Bible out studying the night during the duck hunting trip, I'd like to be able to say that. I can't say that. I don't know where it came from. Um, the grand architect of the universe uh, aids and assists us in many, many, many different ways. And um, I thank him for, for his influence um, that he has on, on all of us as Masons. You know, Masons not a, Masonry is not a religion. We're a fraternal organization, but we try to polish ourselves to be living stones uh, much like our operative masons did when they were building quarries. So um, I just want to share that because I, I thought it was interesting. Um, you never know where the grand, grand uh, where the grand architect of the universe is, is going to uh, play an influence in, in your life. But I had a touching moment recently. Uh, I just want to share that with you. And I, um, I, I appreciate you sharing that. I also am happy that you're okay and that, you know, your son is okay. You. Um, and, you know, I'm happy to hear that the Grand Lodge doesn't surprise me because, you know, I've been to Kentucky and um, I know how friendly the people are, how friendly the Masons are, but the work that the Grand Lodge is doing uh, is, is terrific to see. And that's just another example of, you know, the benefits of Freemasonry is having that strong, uh, having a strong Grand Lodge means it can respond to disasters and help the help its brothers. Um, you know, if we're talking here on December, I can't even think of the date, December 29th, the 30th? 30th. 30th. Tomorrow's New Year's Eve. There you go. Anything happening at the um, Masonic Homes of Kentucky for New Year's Eve? Do your residents get up to no good, you know, causing trouble, partying in the hallways? What the, <laughs> any plans for, uh, for the residents? Uh, well, December 31st, 11.59 p.m. Our life enrichment activities uh, directors are, are very busy all times of the year, making sure that all of our residents live an active lifestyle. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if there are many of them that are are up and, and we'll celebrate watching the, uh, the ball drop in, in Times Square. Um, however, many of them may be like me and I'll probably be good to make it till 10 o'clock 
They had <laughs> him ring it in on on uh, Saturday morning. But um, you know, we our, our residents stay active. Um, they participate in one another's lives, and and it wouldn't surprise me if if many of them are going to go to each other's apartment and and um, and celebrate the new year. Well, I hope that they have a great celebration. And uh, I want to thank both yourself and Brother Reeve for joining me on the podcast. As like I said, Masonic Homes, they're one example of, but a great example of the work that Freemasonry does. They're the relevance of Freemasonry in our communities, in the state, wherever it may be, right? It's just an example of, of something, like you said, of, of how and why Freemasonry remains relevant in our communities. So thank you so much, both of you, for uh, taking the time to join me all the way from Kentucky. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. And, and if we can answer any other questions you might have or any that your viewers or listeners might have, contact us. Google Masonic Homes of Kentucky. Go to our website to find out more information. We're here to serve, and we stand ready to serve anybody um, that needs the services that we provide. Thanks, Cameron. Yes, all the links are in the um, uh, in the description. So, if you want to learn how to contact uh, the ground, uh, the Masonic of Kentucky, the YouTube channels down there, website, phone number, head down to the description. Brother Reeve, thank you so much. It was a pleasure meeting you in Paducah, and thank you for getting this uh, set up. It's much appreciated. It's my privilege.